This is the Marketing Umbrella Podcast, where it's all about getting the information you need from successful leading marketers to build and grow your digital marketing agency. Brought to you by Itumar Shafir, founder and CEO of Umbrella, the technology platform and brand that is powering thousands of marketing agencies around the country. Find him at UmbrellaUS.com. Now, here's your host, Kevin Pruitt. This is indeed the Marketing Umbrella Podcast. My name is Kevin Pro. It's my honor to host this podcast. And we have a very special guest today. He's a serial entrepreneur, author, and investor. He's also the founder and CEO of The Scalable Company, scalable.co, digitalmarketer.com, and a founding partner at Scalable Equity, LLC. This is an equity accelerator that builds, acquires, and invests in B2B media services and software brands. He's also the founder and host of the Traffic and Conversion Summit, the largest digital marketing conference in North America. He also quite literally wrote the book on modern marketing, Digital Marketing for Dummies, which is now in its, is in its second edition. As a sought-after speaker, he has shared the stage with top leaders and celebrities like Richard Branson, Gary Vaynerchuk, Sarah Blakely, Martha Stewart, Tim Ferriss, Damon John, and Dave Ramsey. And according to Shark Tank star Damon John, his companies practically own the internet. Join me in welcoming Ryan Dice to the Marketing Umbrella Podcast. Ryan, thanks again for joining us. Thanks for having me, and apologies for the obnoxiously long uh, bio and intro. I need to talk to my uh, team about tightening that up a bit. <laughs> you thanks know, for everybody who who started to listen to that, and you're still here 15 they, minutes later in spite they, of it. They made it through. You know, it's it's amazing <laughs> that bios like this are never written by the guests. So right. I can yeah. I can assure you that that uh, yeah no this is this I hey this is this is the kind of foundation that we want to we want to lay before we're we're starting to talk to our guests here, but. That's that's a little bit about what you do. What did we forget? What tell us a little bit more about who Ryan Dice is? Well, I mean, I've I've played a marketer on TV for about the past 15, 20 years. Uh yeah, when I if I travel, if I speak, if to the extent that that anybody has heard of me or has heard my name, which I, you know, it's not like I'm famous or anything like that. But to the extent that somebody has, they would generally know me as a marketer. And I am a marketer and I identify as a marketer because I do marketing. Marketing was kind of my first love. But I always learned marketing because I had something to sell. Mm. So I've always been an entrepreneur. I go from literally when I was 19 years old, starting my first company from my college dorm room. I've always just enjoyed starting, scaling, and have, have now gotten really interested and excited about exiting different businesses, having done it a couple of times and seeing the impact it can make. So I love it because I know marketing, I know growth. I also know that growth isn't enough. And I actually spend a lot more of my time today talking and doing the the systems and the ops side of, it, uh, of mm -hmm. the business. So I can go either direction. We could talk a little bit about, about both, but marketing is my first love. Um, but today I run companies and so uh, that's, that's what I do. It, it's amazing how often that we've, we've talked to our guests and and the things that they built were just like scratching their own itch. So it sounds like to me that that based on the success you had with companies early on, it, it created Scalable. So talk a little bit about the the kind of the genesis of Scalable. Well, so I, it, you're absolutely right with, with Scalable. Um, I want to be clear, though, my, the very first business that I ever started had nothing to do with an interest in the topic. I was interested in money. Mm -hmm. Right. I was interested in money. I met a girl uh, and for the first time in my life, I realized that I was broke because I met a girl we've been dating for a couple of weeks. And I'm thinking this is perhaps the woman I'm going to marry. I didn't tell her that at the time. I knew that was kind of creepy, but I knew like this is mm -hmm. probably the woman I'm going to marry. And if I'm going to marry her, I'm going to need a diamond and diamonds are expensive and oh crap, I'm broke. So the very first business that I started had nothing to do with passion in the subject matter. And I think a yeah. lot of people confuse like avocational hobby-like passions with business. Um, I wasn't passionate about it. Uh, I, I had originally started doing building websites for people mm -hmm. because it was something I knew how to do. Nobody else really did. It was 1999. If you could spell HTML and, and SEO, good chance you could get a client. Right. right? And so yeah. there I was at 19. But my very first client, who <laughs> funny enough was a lactation consultant, um, which was as, a little as bit one does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a little bit awkward as a 19-year-old college kid building a lactation a website for with like breast pumps and stuff like on it. My my roommate thought I was into some weird stuff. Anyway, uh, four kids now, by the way, nothing yeah, but love and respect right. for lactation consultants. But um, she had written this ebook on how to make your own baby food, hmm. and 
uh, and she's a really smart woman because what she realized is once my clients are are, are done, like one, once the, the kids have weaned, then they don't need me anymore. And so I don't want to just be about lactation consulting. I want to be about all childhood nutrition. And so she wrote this ebook. It was really cool. Unfortunately, the economy shifted. Mm. Her husband lost his job and she had to go back to work and abandon the entire business and website. So what she gave me as payment, because she couldn't afford to pay me for the website, was this ebook on how to make your own baby food. So my and my very first business online was literally, I need to make some money. I got nothing to sell. Let's see if I can sell this ebook on how to make baby food. And that silly little side hustle uh, was what eventually ballooned into one site and two sites and 20 sites. And before long, it had a little mini publishing empire. And, uh, and, and that was, that was where it all kind of how it all began. And, and you asked about scalable. So I'll, I'll fast forward 15 uh -huh. or so years. I got known for the marketing side because that, that was the, the angle back then. Like if you could figure out marketing, you could win early mm -hmm. on. It was SEO. Mm -hmm. Then it was about Google ads. Then it was about social and social ads. And the game has always changed. But if you were good at marketing, you had an edge. Right. So marketing is what I focused on and marketing is what I talked about. But what I realized as I scaled these different businesses is there comes a time when marketing is not enough. Uh, but I didn't have a venue to talk about all the other stuff that wasn't marketing. So I've got all these businesses that are kind of running on running themselves. We've got operators and people like that that are doing it. I've got digital marketer. I can talk about marketing, but I didn't have anything to talk about my first love and what I actually do, which is the scaling of businesses beyond right. the basics of marketing. And so it was actually after exiting a bunch of companies in 2018 and 2019, coming out of the COVID pandemic, wondering what the heck do I do now? Mm -hmm. That was when we decided, hey, let's go ahead and spin up this new brand, Scalable, and talk about all the stuff that I wasn't talking about before, but I was doing. So how many marketers would you, would you guess um, studied marketing, kind of got in that role in a company or whatever versus those that just learned it. It sounds like to me, you almost learned it out of necessity. You know, you, you had, you learned how to sell the product, you know, how to market the product, so to speak. So how are, are those, those the best marketers out there? The ones that kind of learn by the trial by fire, so to speak. Yeah, in, in my experience and in my, in my judgment, the best marketers in the world are marketers who see themselves as a function of revenue, mm -hmm. not communications. So there's an entire field of, of marketing, whether it's coming out of PR or corporate communications or internal marketing or, you know, you know, insert corporate, all of the above that is classified as marketing and that a lot of marketers are in and, and their job is messaging and, and branding. And look, I'm not knocking that stuff. I think that stuff is important, can be, not in all businesses, but it's important mm -hmm. enough. But I don't believe that the best marketers are the people just ensuring that everybody's got a pen with the company logo on it and, right. and all this messaging and style guide is perfectly deployed across all channels. I think the best marketers in the world are people who their actions and activities directly connect to a cash register ringing mm -hmm. somewhere. Mm -hmm. And, and, those people who started out, like you said, needing to market out of necessity, mm -hmm. they get that better than any because yeah. they market it out of necessity, which is I need to eat food and I need yep. shelter. Yeah, so they would agree 100% with you. Money. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, like let's get some freaking money going. Yep. Uh, and, and so absolutely, I think those are the best marketers in the world. Well, I, I mean, one reason that I would agree wholeheartedly with you is that if the communication side fails, if, if you're not on brand or whatever, and, you know, it, or you do it really well and you don't generate any revenue, it doesn't matter, you know, at the end of the day. But if you do market to revenue, then, I mean, that's what's going to keep allow you to survive, you know, allow you it, to- It'll fix a lot of things. Putting out a press release, saying an imperfect thing, certainly if you're sub $100 million in revenue and, and a private company is, is not going to sink yep. uh, a whole lot of ships, not having the right messaging and, and putting them in the right channels. Well, yeah, that that'll make sure you never get off the ground. You don't have to worry about PR because uh, there's no P to R with. Nobody cares about you. <laughs> That's right. That I um, just listening to like previous interviews you've done. I mean, you talk a lot about systems. Talk a lot about operating systems within within the you know the function of marketing. So, is that is scalable built on a system or a a set of systems that that is just kind of industry agnostic uh it can uh, 
virtually apply across the, the scope of industry? It, it is, and it had to be. It had to be built on a set of systems because right now within our portfolio group, there are 17 companies. Mm -hmm. Some of these companies are B2B services. Some of them are consumer uh, home services and things like that. Some of them are restaurant and retail. Some right. of them are direct to consumer e-commerce. So it it doesn't really help to have one super amazing tactic within within a business. If if you only have one business, it doesn't help because ultimately, if you only have that one tactic, somebody's going to figure it out and it's going to mm -hmm. go away. Yeah, ask me how I know. I've seen I've seen every single mm -hmm. tactic come and go that you can imagine over the last twenty years of doing this stuff, but it certainly doesn't help. And at no point is it helpful if you're running a portfolio model. So yeah, we had to take a step oh. back and say, what is the eighty twenty that just always works? Mm -hmm. Now, once we deploy this you know, getting those extra little edges. Well, that's a function of optimization. That's a function of testing. That's that's a function of, of, of just kind of grinding out of creativity. Mm -hmm. But we needed to have a solid foundation that we could start with that just only always works. And so, yeah, that, that collective set of systems, what we refer to as our scalable operating system, that is what we deploy inside of all of our companies to make sure that they're built upon a solid foundation. What are the foundational pillars in the system itself that are, you kind of build and, you know, across the board you utilize? The first step, and this is something if you're listening or watching this right now, that you could go and do today is to simply visualize your core value drivers in the business. Now, that's a fancy way of saying it. So let me uh, let me translate that really quickly. Businesses, all businesses do two things. We sell stuff and we fulfill the stuff we sold. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's it. Like, I mean, yep. there could be a little bit more complexity in terms of what, but at, at its core, that's what we all do. I mean, and, and yes, you need to make the stuff for created or imported. Mm -hmm. that, that's but like, let's assume you got that. You've got the product, you got the service. Mm -hmm. We got to sell it and then we got to fulfill it to make sure that the people who bought it are happy that they bought it. Mm -hmm. Now, if I ask most entrepreneurs and certainly most marketers, how do customers happen? How do clients happen? They can tell me roughly, but they can't show me. If I say, when you get a new customer, you get a new client, then what happens? How do you make sure that you deliver on the promise? They can tell me, but they can't show me. Now, there, there is a tool, there is a methodology with you know that is taught in business schools. I didn't invent it, but it's called business process mapping mm -hmm. or value flow mapping. Again, I didn't create this. But if you were to go and hire a Six Sigma certified expert to come in, you'd pay them hundreds of thousands of dollars <laughs> and they would do what I'm about to tell you how to do in 30 seconds. OK, what you need to do is get out some sticky notes, a Sharpie and a whiteboard. And I simply want you to go up to the whiteboard in the in the upper le left hand corner. I want you to write out on a sticky note. How do people become aware that you exist? So are you running Facebook and Instagram ads? Great. That goes on a sticky note. Put it in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, are you doing more organic? Okay, great. Organic SEO. That gets a sticky note. What are all the things that you're doing to create awareness? That is the first stage of customers and clients happening. Mm -hmm. Then I want you to go to the bottom right-hand corner, the, the, the right-hand side of your whiteboard. And on another sticky note, I just want you to write close sale or contract signed or whatever the last step is for when you actually get a customer or a client. Mm -hmm. Great. So we've got the beginning. We've got the end. I want you to go back to the beginning and say, okay, so somebody sees one of our ads. Then what happens? Well, they're going to go to a landing page. Great. So get another sticky note, right? Landing page. Great. Then what happens? And all you're going to do is you're going to ask yourself, then what? Then what? Then mm -hmm. what? Over and over and over again until you have connected the dots from the, the first piece to the end. Mm -hmm. Once you've done that for the growth, what we call the growth engine, then do that for the fulfillment side. If you visualize this on a whiteboard with sticky notes, and then you bring your team members in and you ask them, okay, team, what did we miss? You will, when you're done, you will, for the first time ever, have a picture of how customers happen. Yeah. And yeah. this is the beauty. Once you have that, Everything else from an operating system perspective gets built upon that. Mm -hmm. That is the foundation of everything. And this is so different because what everybody else does, man, is they think the first step is to set goals. 
you know, and we're going to set our goals. And then from that, we're going to break our goals in little chunks. Then we're going to have a meeting with them. Then we're going to figure out what do we need to do? No, horse crap. The first question you got to answer is how do we actually deliver value to the marketplace? Mm -hmm. Like, why do we exist? And, and so you got to do two things. You've got to capture new customers and clients, and then you need to serve them. You need to sell mm -hmm. and you need to serve. Mm -hmm. So visualize those two things in basic flow charts. Once you have the sticky notes on a whiteboard, it's pretty easy to then, you know, use a any flow charting tool to, to visualize it and make it pretty yeah. and connect all the boxes. And you can put little diamonds in there for if it can go one way or another, uh -huh. you know, fork in the road. But once you have those two things, step one is done. Now that seems long and that seems hard, but again, this is the foundation. Now what you can do is you can look at those steps. Uh, you can look at those value engines. Step two is let's identify what we call the power stages. Power stages are those steps and stages, those sticky notes that are high stakes, high human error. Hmm. What are the steps and stages that really we got to get it right and there's a good chance we screw it up? Hmm. Now let's build playbooks and checklists and SOPs for those. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest mistakes that entrepreneurs make that I see business owners make across the board when they decide it's time to systemize is they try to systemize and document everything. Right. Don't do that. You don't have to. Your people will hate you. You won't like it. And when you're done, you'll have so many of these things. If you actually pull it off, nobody will look at them because they don't know what they're supposed to be looking at. Most of the business we, we run 5, 10, 15, 20 playbooks because all we're doing is we're auditing those those value engines, mm -hmm. those, those, those flow charts we did to say, okay, what are these steps and stages that we can't screw up? There might be three or four per. Mm -hmm. Done. Then we move on and we say, okay, who? step three is, who does all of these different things? And we we now document who is responsible for that. We've got a tool that we use called the High Output Team Canvas, where we literally just write out all of our team members' names and the particular you know, bullet points of, of mm -hmm. the stuff that they're accountable to. But again, right. we start from those value engines, from those from those business process maps. Like, because that's the stuff that's important. Mm -hmm. We do the same thing, number four, uh, step four with scorecards. How do we know these that these different steps or stages are working? That's how we make sure we're not tracking vanity metrics. Yeah. Then we can have meetings where we are, can do some strategic planning. But now we're doing strategic planning and goal setting based on this pesky thing called data. Now when we meet, we're not just meeting to hear ourselves talk. We're meeting to review the scorecards mm -hmm. where we're ta talking about like, okay, where, where are we off? Where are the bottlenecks in these processes? And then the game just becomes continuing to unblock bottlenecks. The sixth piece is where we end is what we call the clarity compass. This is where on a single sheet of paper, you list out the company's goals, you list out the company's core purpose or mission, mm. you list out your company's uh, values, core values, and you list out what's known as your strategic anchors. So your core competitive advantages. Because if you know those four things, kind of anybody in the company, if they run any decision through that filter, is probably gonna make a good decision. Yeah. Does it get us closer to our goals? Yes, it does. Great. Does it align with our overarching purpose and mission? Yes, it does. Does it align with our core values? Yes, it does. Can we actually pull it off? Does it align with one of our um, with one of our strategic advantages? Yes, it does. Cool. Then let's do it. Those are the six pieces that make up the operating system. Mm. But it all starts with first visualizing how do you sell stuff? How do you fulfill it once you've sold it? So if everybody will just do that, you're going to be light years ahead of your competition. I mean, it sounds like you've almost flipped this process on its head, you know, be yeah. because you said so many companies start out with the kind of the goal. OK, here are our, here's our goals. Now, what are the, the, the tiny steps we've got to take to fulfill those goals? And and I love the fact that that you let the data drive the goals. You know, you let the, the process yeah. and, and the measurements drive those goals. But talk about where does product market fit? Where does that fit in this process or is that assumed that that's already been accomplished before you put the, the system in place? Everything I just described should not happen until you've got product market fit. Mm -hmm. So until you have product market fit, which usually is going to show up somewhere between $100,000 and $500,000 in revenue, that's just about how many sales you're going to have to make to figure out if anybody actually wants the dang thing that you're selling. Yep. And, and this is more important if you're actually delivering on the promised value. I've, I've seen lots mm -hmm. of people go out there and sell a bunch of products into the market and be like, oh, we're crushing it. 
only to realize that nobody came back and bought again. Nobody mm -hmm. told their friends that, that it was any good. And a lot of people refunded. So you got bad reviews, no referrals, no return purchases. You got no business. Mm -hmm. So we always want to make sure before we go in and build an operating system around a business, you want to, you just want to make sure you're not systemizing a turd. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, let's make sure we got something that's really, really solid here. So it is rare that we're going to begin to even think about installing one of these operating systems until we have a business that's, that that's generating run rating um a half a million dollars a year and we want to we want to see that it's getting pretty close to to about a million bucks a year prior to that frankly you can run on what we refer to as a uos where you are the operating system mm -hmm. and the operating system is you that'll be good to about a million two million dollars um beyond that if you don't upgrade to yeah. an operating system that's a bit more scalable you're going to be so burned out you're going to want to just blow your up, blow up your own business. Yeah. I've seen entrepreneurs do that. So yeah, and not only you, that. you know, you're in staff, you know, as well. Oh, yeah. I mean, you burned them out as well in that process, but yeah, they'll, they'll quit. Your best yeah. people will, will quit. Your worst people will stick around. <laughs> I've seen it happen. Ask me how I know. Race to the uh, mediocre, mediocrity bottom. Yeah. That's right for sure. Um, you talk a bit about um, just how to scale and get out of the way. What, what do you mean when you talk about that? Is the system so good and so well balanced that you, it's, you know, set it and forget it kind of the, the old late night, you know, Ron Popeil, you know, just the, the oven, you know, that you could buy at midnight, get a set of steak, steak knives with it. But what is the, yeah. what is the, what do you mean when you talk about just getting out of the way? Once the operating system is fully installed, and it really is those six steps that we talked about. Mm -hmm. Kind of the, the first phase is you hand off the execution, the doing of the stuff. Because right. right now, most of the small business owners, most entrepreneurs, they're uniquely responsible and accountable to a significant value chain, to a significant value driver. It might be that leads and sales don't happen without them. Mm -hmm. Or it might be that clients you know, and customers don't get served without them. Or it might be all of the above. So the way that it happens is by beginning to hand those things off. Mm -hmm. And the way that it happens is exactly what I described. Mm -hmm. We're going to map it, visualize right. it. That means we can show it to somebody else. We're going to document how to do it. Uh, and then we're going to get, and then we're, we're literally going to hand off one sticky note at a time to somebody. So it's not, here's what you don't do. And I'm so freaking sick. It, it sucks because, and I, I don't blame um, Gina Wickman, and I don't blame like the whole traction mm -hmm. movement. Have you mm -hmm. read the book Traction? Mm -hmm. Yes. I, and I, th I think yep. it's good. Like there's so many great ideas in there, but the way that most people talk about it is that, oh, all I need to, and this is not by the way, what they taught in the book. Mm -hmm. It's a perversion of what was taught in the book. So, but I believe that one of the single greatest entrepreneurial lies that have, has ever been told is this idea that, oh, you just need to make this one magical unicorn integrator higher and everything's going to be fine. <laughs> They'll just do all the work you don't want to do and you can step away. Yeah. What well, doesn't work? Because mm -hmm. if you don't have an operating system for yep. the operator to operate, you got a glorified executive assistant. It's just a fact of that. Like they're not going to yep. do it. I mean, we say it all the time: good people don't fix broken systems. Broken systems break good people. Mm. So you got to be a part mm -hmm. of that initial systemization phase. But once you have your value engines mapped, once you got some basic playbooks, once you've tasked other people out, execution just happens. Now the next piece that you're going to get sucked back in. Because let's say, okay, everything's just running on its own. You're feeling good. You're going to get the shoulder tap. You're going to get the, hey, you got a minute when something isn't working quite right. When something's a little yep. behind. And then they're going to ask you to swoop in and fix it. Mm -hmm. And one of the worst things that you can do is that. Because mm -hmm. what you are going to do to your team is, is, is number one, you're going to rob them of the opportunity uh, to grow. Mm -hmm. uh, you're, you're also going to further groove in the vision uh, that you have, the identity that you have mm -hmm. for yourself as you're the one who saves the yep. day. You're the champion. Yeah. You're the champion. Yeah. Can't do it. But mm -hmm. the reality is, is your team will not know how to fix things until they have scorecards and meeting rhythms. Mm -hmm. Right. And so when you have scorecards in place, they can see where in the machine things are broken down. So they know, oh, it's not just that we have less sales. It's that upstream, this particular landing page is below target in terms of conversion rate. Right. What if we go in there and do some basic optimization? Your people are probably pretty smart and can fix a lot of things if they know where to look. Mm -hmm. The scorecards tell them where to look and the meeting rhythms give them the opportunity to sort of ritualize optimization. So 
kind of the next cool thing that happens once everybody is doing everything, you're coming to the weekly scorecard meetings and there's some metrics that are red and your team's talking about it and they're figuring out how do we get it back to green? And there's some other metrics that are yellow because your team is like, yeah, it's behind now, but we've already got a plan for getting it back into the green. Mm -hmm. And you go to these meetings for a bit and you've suddenly realized I have nothing to add here. No they doubt. Got it. They've taken, they've taken ownership. Yeah. 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 The I, last I piece that. is that, is that clarity compass piece when you, when you hand off decision-making like high level mm -hmm. decision-making, it'll be the last one that you do. Um, but, and that is maybe when you want to bring in that, that outside integrator mm -hmm. operator type right. type person. Um, but it's shocking once you have an operating system in place and a solid team to run it, they got it. Mm -hmm. They got it. You can step away. We we have all of our clients take a 30 day vacation just to prove that it's going to be okay with them gone. Um, wow. So. I, uh, has that ever come back to bite you? No, no, I mean, that, no that not, not if system. I follow yeah. the, the pro it's a great question. Not yeah. if I follow the process, mm -hmm. there have been times when I personally have gotten burned out. Mm -hmm. And I fired myself or I just stuck my head in the sand and gone on a vacation, mm -hmm. air quotes, because uh, I just couldn't take anymore. And that that's come back to bite me 100 percent of every time because mm -hmm. um, that's not what you do. Right. You don't get to do that as an entrepreneur. It's like as a parent saying, I don't feel like parenting today. You don't get to take the day off. What yeah. are you talking about? But, you know, you were, so, you're not you're uh, you're not following your own systems. then, if, if that's the case, you, you kind of correct. stepped out and, without without the foundation in place. And I'll tell you, I learned this stuff by doing it wrong for, for over a decade. Those are the lessons so, we learn most. <laughs> heck yeah. <laughs> they stick with us the longest, for sure. It's not the, the win, it's the just longest. the failures you survived. That's exactly right. <laughs> that is exactly right. You, you, uh, I want to ask you just kind of a nice follow-up to what you just talked about was, you know, that's, that's one common myth. It's kind of, you know, just hire the right person and put them in and they'll, you know, things will, will just automatically, you know, fix themselves, so to speak. But what are, what are one or two other common myths um, that are just kind of standard maybe in the industry about scaling your business? Yeah. One of the, the, the biggest is that kind of collective, you know, the, just get the right people on the bus mm -hmm. or, um, it's a, it's a who problem, not a how problem or all problems in business or people problems. This kind of like fortune cookie wisdom makes you look smart on social media in the trenches. It just doesn't freaking work. Yeah. Cause let's be honest, like people cost money. Most mm -hmm. businesses are cash flow and margin constrained. Just go hire more people. Mm -hmm. Thanks chief. Like that's not <laughs> helpful. And, and let's say you do, let's say you do find the money. What time are you going to spend to train them? Yeah. Right. So, so I'm going to hire people I can't afford. I'm going to set them up for failure. I'm going to let them like linger around very expensively for a few mm -hmm. weeks or a few months. And then ultimately I'm going to fire them or they're going to quit. Yep. Or they're going to leave. No, yeah. this doesn't, yep. yeah, this doesn't work. Mm -hmm. We got to solve for the core systems issues first because good people don't fix broken systems. Broken systems break good people. And this applies at all levels. That's the first big one. This, the second big one that I see a lot is entrepreneurs saying, you know, I personally just need to get more efficient, more effective. Uh, anytime I've got, you know, I've, I've got friends invariably it's my entrepreneurial buddies who are always telling me about the, their new journal or their new productivity app mm -hmm. that are the most burned out, least effective business <laughs> owners I know. Um, the most effective entrepreneurs I know, they might keep a journal and, and a calendar because they're adults, but they're not <laughs> worrying about like they're tracking adults. and measuring every per, per, you know thing with like the perfect morning routine and all this yeah. kind of, they're not that like fragile because their business kind of happens whether they're there or not. Mm -hmm. And so I would say changing your mindset shift to uh, the, you know, the realizing that the more valuable I am to my business, the less valuable my business is. Mm -hmm. And if that's true, and if you think about it, it is, then your job should, should be to be less valuable to your business, not by sucking, right. but by building systems such that your business doesn't need it. You're not essential. So becoming more productive, isn't it? And the, the third thing that is the most common is, um, uh, just, I just need to grow more growth will fix everything. And mm -hmm. as a marketer, as a growth guy, I get it. I thought it for years in 2016, I had three companies simultaneously on the Inc 500 list. Sounds mm -hmm. super cool until you realize that out of those three, two of them imploded because they grew too fast with not enough systems. Mm -hmm. One of them went from 500,000 to 3 million to $30 million. Again, it sounds really cool and really impressive until you realize that the month that we had to basically shut everything down, we lost $2 million, had to lay off 180 people wow. a few weeks before Christmas. Mm -hmm. Why? Because yep. growth doesn't fix everything. At some point, if your business is held together by duct tape, bubblegum, and hope, it will come apart. So 
Don't think growth is going to fix everything. It doesn't. 67% of Inc. 5000 businesses fail. It has a, Inc. 500 companies have a higher failure rate than the average non-Inc. 5000 counterpart. So it's not about growth. It, it, it's, it's not about um, you, know, you being more productive. And it definitely isn't just about throwing people at your problems. My, my thing is, my goal is not to build a business around rock stars and A players. My goal is to build a business that doesn't require them, mm. me included. Wow. That is my goal. That, I, I love that, uh, that distinction that, that um, because that, that's, that brings clarity to the, to the need and the implementation of a good system, you know, just kind of, you just come full circle in, in the chat we've had, had here. And you, you know, I, I mentioned that in the intro, your digital marketing for dummies book, but you've got another book coming out that, uh, or has come out recently. So let's, let's talk yeah. about that. Yeah. So I, 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 I I believe that you should only write a book if you have something to say. I'm mm -hmm. not a huge fan of like business card books and things like that. Yeah. It's just, there's so much, there's such a dearth of information. Mm -hmm. If you're going to kill trees, it should be worth it. <laughs> and, um, and so people have been saying for years, like, oh, you should write another book. You should write another book. It's like, I don't have anything else to say right now. I've kind of said everything that I know to say on marketing. Um, and on business, I felt like I was still figuring it out. Mm -hmm. Like for the past 15 years, I've been figuring it out. And just over the last few years, I don't want to say we're perfect and that and I solved business because that's not <laughs> it. That would be ridiculous. But we've done it enough times internally with our own businesses uh, and with our uh, private clients mm -hmm. that we knew, OK, we, we've got a We've got a system. We have a playbook here that, that works. And so I decided to write it into a book. I, I for a season there for a time back in 2021, I, I was teaching this through one of the higher ticket cohort based right. courses. People could pay me three to $5,000 to, to learn all this stuff. I was like, screw it. Um, you know, when, when I was in that part, I, I would have just rather had a book. Mm -hmm. You know, I love, I love the idea of a course and things like that, but just give me a book and give me all the tools. So I literally took the content from the course, rewrote it all. This is not written by Chad GPT. Uh, I took all the content from the course, all the action items and all the resources. And I put in a book called get scalable. The operating system your business needs to run and scale without you. So that's that is the what the book is about, and it is our playbook for how we build operating systems in businesses so that yep they can grow, they can also be more profitable, but ultimately they can be um, way more sellable, exitable, not dependent upon the founder. It's the book I wish I had in 2016. Maybe those two businesses that wound up failing would still be around today. And I would be mm -hmm. a few hundred million dollars richer. That would be cool. <laughs> well, and, and I think the best books are those that are written out of, out of lessons learned and not just yeah, how, how do I increase my, my brand authority, you know, in the, in the markets marketplace, but where, where, I mean, I'm assuming it's available at all the major outlets. It's available on Amazon. Yeah, you can, you can go get it. It costs the approximate price of a book. Um, I don't know. Amazon's always changing the pricing and there's different <laughs> versions of it. Um, my goal this year, I want to, I want to give away 10,000 copies of this book. That that's my goal. I believe if we put it in the hands of 10,000 entrepreneurs, there, there will be a shift. Mm -hmm. It will, it will change some lives. It will help some people. Uh, and I have no problem admitting this. It will help us to identify possible portfolio companies and private yeah. clients. So, yeah. I mean, we're all marketers here, so I, I don't sure. say that with any sense of, you know, shame. No apologies but, necessary. <laughs> yeah, but it's a marketing podcast for crying out loud. Right. It's like dentists being angry about teeth. That's uh, so. Right. So yeah. So, but I really do. I mean, I'm at I'm at a stage in my life right now. I've had enough wins, stacked them up. I'm 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 good. I'm at a stage where I'm ready to give. Where I'm ready to give back. I'm ready to help, and I'm ready to be a part of companies at a higher level. And so I'm not really about selling courses on the scalable mm -hmm. side. We've got, you know, we'll help you build out an operating system if somebody is ready. But everything that we know is in a book and it's 20 or 30 bucks. Um, mm -hmm. But like I said, I wanted to lower it even more. So if you go to getscalable.com forward slash free, you can get the book for free. Um, you, I do ask that people cover shipping, sure. but it is literally just shipping. It's not marked up. I, mm -hmm. We went in there. How much does mm -hmm. it cost to ship the dang thing? Didn't mark up the packaging, didn't mark up the mm -hmm. printing. I'm losing you know, a few bucks every time we ship one of these suckers out. But I believe if we get it in the hands of entrepreneurs, it's going to save a lot of businesses. It's going to generate wealth. It's going to generate impact. Um, and I'm very confident that's going to trickle down. So yeah, whether you go to Amazon or you go to getscalable.com forward slash free, it's, it is very much out there in the wild. 
Okay, it's getscalable.com. Yeah, free. the okay. book is getscalable.com. The company okay. is scalable.co. Right. So right, I want to we make decided that to make it very confusing. Yeah. <laughs> we will make sure that those will those will be in the show notes for the for the episode. But um this is I think is a great time to kind of transition to our rapid fire round right at the end of Ooh, every episode. We uh you're you're gonna think these are crazy, disparate questions, but but there is a method to our madness as we as we mm. ask these questions because it, it is I think it's so interesting to hear the answers, you know, from our guests. But um, I'm just gonna these are rapid questions, just the first thing that comes to mind, short, quick answers. Uh, did you get along with your parents growing up? I did very much. Yeah, they got divorced when I was two, but they got along with each other and I had the best stinking childhood. You asked for short, quick ones. You don't get those from me. My, um, <laughs> I'll tell you how I learned marketing. It's, I think this is a worthwhile story. My, my parents were divorced, but I would do a week with my mom and then a week with my dad, but I caught the school bus from my mom's house. So when I was staying with my dad, he dropped me off at my mom's on his way to work in the morning, but he worked construction. So he dropped me off sometimes five 30, six yeah. o'clock in the morning. Well, what's the only thing on TV at five, 6 AM? infomercials right. so you talk you're talking about ron popeil and like said it and forget it like, man that was my childhood that was yeah. where i grew up and so i i grew up uh learning poppy watching infomercials so now i got along with my parents great still do love them to death um imperfect people though sure. they are i never wondered if i was loved do you have siblings only child do you have any pets i have two rabbits um that my daughters are very into rabbits. I figured if worse comes to worse, they can become food. <laughs> Apocalypse happens. Sorry, we're going to eat. eat Never days, know. Eat yeah, she's got a pond in the backyard. <laughs> rabbits and that. I think we get friends. No, no. Rabbits, they're, they're, I don't know why. I, we're not pet people. I got four kids. I, we don't need more <laughs> little things running around. I got to take care of. What time do you wake up in the morning? On a, on a work uh, day? 6 a.m., whether I like it or not. I don't set an alarm. And I always wake up between 5.45 and 6.15. And what time you go to bed? 11. Ideal vacation spot, money, not an object. My wife and I go to uh, Spain pretty regularly. We love Spain, Andalusia, that area. Mm -hmm. We also have a beach house too. in the Texas coast. And as much as I love getting away to Europe and, and uh, just seeing new and beautiful places, there's something about going down to the Texas coast, staying in our house. We know it. It's comfortable just chilling on the beach, doing absolutely mm -hmm. nothing. Yep. So it's a toss up between those two. One of them's three and a half hours away. The other's, you know, 10 and a half hours away. Kind of down in the Padre Island area. Um, it's, uh, yeah, uh, Port Aransas. So Corpus Christi, Port Aransas area. Okay. Yeah. Um, tell me how faith affects how you do business. It's, I mean, my faith is what drives everything. I was, uh, became a Christian as a, as a child and, uh, have taken my faith seriously ever since. I actually, for a season, thought I was going to go to seminary. Hmm. It wasn't until my college minister said, I cannot affirm your calling, um, <laughs> He, which he was right, by the way. Yeah. Um, but he he said, he said for a couple of reasons, Ryan, one, uh, I don't know that you have the patience to pastor. You would probably be a decent <laughs> enough, you know, preacher, Love but it. that is not <laughs> the same as pastoring a, and uh, shepherding a flock. Uh, and he said, also, it seems like you got these little internet businesses that are doing well. Mm -hmm. You know, you can always go to seminary. They'll always take you. But, you know, I've, I've got a sense that God's probably calling you to to the public sphere. And, and you know, maybe you should see what happens there, especially since you think you want to marry this girl. Mm -hmm. uh, and my guess is her parents, her dad would like it a little bit more if, you know, you had some some businesses going on and things like that. So it only affects everything. <laughs> Absolutely. I love that. That is a light in the marketplace. So you're king for a day. What is one thing that you would change about the marketing space globally? I would force everybody to learn copywriting and to emphasize messaging over the tactical aspects of targeting and algorithms. I believe that we are shifting into a post-targeting, um, fully algorithm-driven mm -hmm. world where for the past 20, 25 years, marketing has been defined by the the ability to target. Where mm -hmm. we are headed, it's going, we're kicking it old school. We're going back to where the message is going to be the thing that matters because all marketing will be mass. Mm -hmm. So 
I would basically require marketers to learn messaging again, storytelling, get get really good at copy mm -hmm. and not just direct response copy, but relational branded copy. I mm. said it, I know it's anathema in a lot of marketing circles, but at some point you have to shift from direct response, pure direct response into relational branded copy if you want to be able to exist over the long term. Love it. Love it. Ryan, thank you. Uh, just thank you for taking time and just sharing your story and just kind of telling us the kind of the journey of scalable and 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 walking through the system and I really appreciate you just taking time in your busy schedule and and really just providing value to those that that are trying to grow and scale marketing agencies which is exactly the target of this podcast and we want to provide value in that space but thanks again I want to just uh, wish you the best in all of your endeavors and just thank you again have a great week thank you thank you for having me Thank you for tuning in to another great episode of the Marketing Umbrella Podcast, where we provide the information you need from successful leading marketers to build and grow your digital marketing agency. To learn more, go to UmbrellaUS.com.